Hey everyone, this is Kevin from the chesswebsite.com. Today we are in round three of our coverage of the 2017 Grand Prix from Geneva. Our competitors today, White's going to be played by Pavel Elianov. He is from the Ukraine, currently ranked 19th in the world. His first two rounds so far, he has a win and a loss. He didn't play in the first tournament, so he still has this tournament and the next one to put up a good result. He is still in contention to be in one of the top two players at the end of the Grand Prix. So excited to see him play because we don't get to see him too often. His opponent playing the black pieces, Jan Deponiic, currently ranked 17th in the world. He's out of contention mathematically as far as getting in the top two. He's played in the first two legs of the Grand Prix. We'll be playing the last one. Uh, but all in all, he's still playing for both a higher rating and there's money on the line. Even if you're not in the top two, there's still a lot to be playing for. He's more known for Rapid and Blitz, probably one of the, the top three players in the world uh, in Rapid and Blitz. Um, always puts up. Tough competition in those tournaments, uh, but all in all, very strong competitor. So we're going to get started. White starts out with pawn to e4, uh, pawn to c5, so the Sicilian defense. We don't see the Sicilian defense as much uh, anymore, which you know Sam can be somewhat surprising knowing is how well the Sicilian defense plays, uh, especially at the highest levels. Uh, knight to f3, uh, pawn d6, pawn d4, so kind of the, your normal lines that you would see. And then after knight to c3, we get pawn to a6. This is getting into the Nidorf defense, uh, really one of the, the top lines in the Sicilian defense. It blocks off this critical square here on b5, which the bishop would like to come to, bishop to b5 check, uh, potentially the knight to b5. Uh, Black has uh, some ideas here. Uh, he later on might want to play pawn here to, to e5. Uh, he could push forward with pawn to b5, uh, then activate his light square bishop. Uh, start to really have an advantage on the queen side of the board. He can get his rook over here to c8, control the semi-open file. So that's kind of what Black's going to be looking for uh, in the Night Dwarf defense. White has a few options from here. You can continue with the main line, which is bishop here to g5, then play pawn to f4. Uh, decides to go for a little quieter move. Uh, this is a little bit more aggressive. Uh, Black playing the Sicilian offense many times is an aggressive line. You may look at it and say that he hasn't really extended his pieces too far, uh, but he has a pretty aggressive uh, setup once he starts to counterattack, starting pushing forward with his pawns, getting his minor pieces involved into the game. Uh, so White a lot of times will counter this with their own aggression. Uh, White decides in this particular game to play a little quieter and play bishop to e2, getting ready to castle on the king side, not really extend his pieces and play that pawn to f4, which is pretty aggressive from White's point of view. Now pawn to e5, Black also had the option of pawn to e6, uh, but uh, decided to continue with the main ideas of the knight dwarf defense. When you do see this pawn to e5, uh, it is important to note that the pawn on d6 is a backward pawn uh, and sometimes can be difficult for Black to hold on to. White towards the middle getting into the end game will start to kind of attack the square and black has to use some of his minor pieces sometimes or even a rook to kind of defend this pawn here on d6 so white kicks his back uh, his knight back here to b3 uh, bishop here to e7 getting ready to castle on the king side a uh, bishop to e3 had some options. He still could play this bishop to g5, but uh, after we saw bishop to e2, more of the quiet game, uh, no one really expected the bishop to come beyond uh, e3. So it does want to continue his development, but does not want to bring out bishop to g5, knowing uh, that that's kind of not the game plan he's been going with. Now bishop to e6 uh, did have the option of pushing forward with his pawn to b5, uh, trying to bring his bishop here to b7, but decides instead to go ahead and bring it here to e6, uh, start to attack uh, this knight here on uh, b3. Now knight to d5, just saying, hey, if you want to exchange in the center of the board, uh, that's fine with me. This does open up this pawn here on e4 for the knight. Uh, I would recommend not taking this, and you don't see that in the game. Uh, if the knight were to take here on e4, it gets very tricky with bishop to b6, the queen check, as I like to call it. Uh, queen's kind of in a tough spot. If you kind of look at it and say, well, you can go to c8 or d7. We'll kind of look at both. We'll look at the worst move first, which would be queen to d7. Because now knight to c7, check, forking the rook here on a8. Uh, after the king were to move, you don't want to move it here to d7 or d8 because that would be a discovered attack after knight to a8. That would be check. Uh, so after king to f8, that's kind of a terrible spot in general because the rook's kind of trapped here on h8 for a while. We see the knight take on a8. And this knight can't really go anywhere productive. If he were to come to 
uh, C6, okay, that's fine. Then I can still come back here to C7. He's going to be safe. Uh, this is a, a little bit worse than if he were to, let's say, play queen to C8. Still going to see the same knight to C7 check fork. Uh, but now after king to F8, and we see a capture. Now that I can come here to D7, which the queen was in D7 before, this is attacking the bishop on uh, B6. So the knight can't just freely come back here because that would fall. So may decide from here, just to go ahead and bring the bishop back here to E E3, uh, lose his knight. But he did get that rook, and he also kind of stopped his opponent from developing his major piece here on H8, uh, and the king is no longer able to castle. Uh, so all in all, definitely not going to be the best recommendation to take uh, with his knight here on E4, uh, but he decides to go ahead and play knight to D7. Now, if you kind of look at this without looking at what would happen if the knight takes on E4, this may look like a simple development move, but it does more than that. The knight on D7 is actually attacking this pawn on E4 because of what we just looked at. Now the knight can freely take on E4, doesn't have to worry about the bishop coming down to a B6 just because the knight can take that right away. Uh, so white has to kind of respond with just looks like a development move. Uh, and he responds with queen to uh, d3. Uh, and this is protecting this pawn here on e4. So these are some of the, what's nice about the Sicilian defense, especially the Nidorf, there's a lot of theory that goes into this. So players have been playing these lines for, for many, many years and kind of looked at these situations. Uh, but for someone that may not be familiar with some of the deep lines in the Nidorf defense, this is some of the stuff that they think about. And as if you're playing in your own game, you want to make sure that you look at and say, you know, what, you know, why would he play knight to d5? Why is he not taking this pawn? Uh, and kind of how do I respond if he plays knight to d7? If you don't see that queen to, to d3, then you can start to, to gobble up material here on e4 since you are protected as black. But from Black's point of view, decides to go ahead and castle on the king side, uh, and then pawn up here to a4. Could have played a little bit more, uh, I would say, drawlish, if you will. Uh, Magnus Carlsen just earlier this year played castle on the king side. It was very easy for Black to go ahead and uh, draw in this game. Uh, White decides to go and play for a little bit more aggressive line and plays pawn here to a4. Uh, and then the bishop captures on d5. We start to see an exchange in the center of the board. Knight down here to c5 after the exchange. Then pawn up here to c4. Solidifying this pawn on d5. This is now a protected pass pawn. And this is one of the things that White's going to be looking to do in this game. He does have the paired bishop right here. Uh, he will be looking to push this pawn up further in the game. He still has the option of castling on either side of the board. Castling on the king side is a little bit safer. Uh, but we started to see him shift his approach from a kind of conservative opening, uh, now going with this pawn to, to a4. He, he definitely has the option now of castling on the king or queen side and then throwing everything he can at his opponent's king side of the board. Definitely would be very aggressive. Black continues with queen to c7. Used to be more of a pawn to e4, but the meta shifted to a queen to c7. The queen down here, c2, allows him to just protect more of these pawns on board. He can now protect the, the pawn on b2 and a4, which he wasn't able to before. Uh, and that allows him, if he wants to castle on the queen side, to get his rook over to the king side of the board, and not have to worry about protecting that uh, with his rook on a1. Pawn to g4, and that signals to everyone that, okay, we're going to have a strong attack here. We've moved away from our passive, uh, just kind of wait and see. We are now getting into the castle on the queen side, throw everything at our opponent. We have the double bishops uh, start to align those at the king side of the board from black. Black, on the other hand, uh, wants to kind of see if he has any room to kind of get around. Uh, he can has a nice little outpost here on d4 if he can get there. Uh, he has the bishop and the queen. He can line up and start to attack his opponent, uh, but he wants to make sure that he still has a pretty strong defense in front of his king because white's going to be coming for him. Pawn to e4, castle on the queen side of the board, bishop d6, some of the stuff we talked about. Uh, pawn to g5, forcing the knight to move. Knight comes back here to d7. King to b1 wants to get off this dark square diagonal with the bishop. Uh, it's a little bit safer here on b1. Knight down here, e5, and then pawn to h4, as we talked about, pushing everything on the king side of the board. Knight down here to f3, attacking his pawn on h4, and then rook to h3. I'm not really sure that the rook to h3 does too much. He's not going to exchange material here on f3, give up his rook for knight He's not going to be doing that. Uh, and besides that, this knight's not really doing anything too much right now. 
Uh, instead, I would have just played pawn to h5, uh, continuing with the same game plan as before. Decides to play rook here to h3. Queen to d7, attacking the rook. Rook comes back here to h1. Kind of seems like a wasted move from white, in my opinion. Queen to uh, e7, and now pawn to h5 is no longer an option because the knight can just come back here to g5. Bishop can't take because now it's protected by the queen. So I think he had an opportunity to just extend a little bit with his pressure. Decided not to. Instead, uh, decides to go ahead and take with his bishop here on f3. Uh, it's kind of a nuisance with the outpost with the knight on f3. So it says, let's, let's go ahead and get rid of that. Uh, I'm going to just open up the board a little bit more. So pawn takes here uh, on f3 uh, and then pawn to h5. Black looks at the board state and says, let's attack on the queen side of the board since you're going to focus over here on the king side. And why could continue on the king side of the board if you wanted to instead decided to worry about the queen side a little bit so we do see some exchange on board a queen over here to d7 attacking the pawn queen to d3 still centralizing the queen uh getting it along this d file as well as protecting the square here on b5 a uh, rook over here to b8 adding another attacker on the square to b5 uh and then white says okay let's continue with our game plan pawn to h6 and then pawn here to g6 but this does start to take away some of the squares that the black king can go to bishop down here to d2 uh, and then after the rook takes, then the bishop's going to come here to c3. Very strong attack. Uh, can eventually bring it here to g7 if he wanted to. Rook down here to b3. Rook over here, e1. Queen, g4. So both sides starting to put a lot of pressure on each other. Uh, a lot of crazy situations that they could get into. Uh, rook up here to e4. And this is where it gets a little interesting. This is a pretty uh, crazy move for white, saying I'm okay giving up some material with the exchange, I really want to focus on this pawn here on d5. Uh, and so black says, okay, uh, first I got to get my queen out of the way. And then we start to see queen over here to f3, bishop to e5. Uh, and this is where the plan continues with rook taking on e5, giving up his rook here on e5 in exchange for that bishop. So the queen takes and then pawn pushes forward to d6. So we look at it as far as materials concerned, black is winning in this game, uh, but black does have to worry about this pawn pushing forward. Anytime, anytime you have a passed pawn, rule number one is push that pawn. Rules number two through five are referred to rule number one. We see pawn to f6 and then pawn to a d7. And as far as what uh, you know, black really has to do here, first he needs to go ahead and take uh, the bishop right here after the queen takes. The queen really needs to go ahead and take this queen right here on c3. He could easily take it. Pawn recaptures. Black has more pawns on board. He could bring his rook over here to d8. Uh, he could eventually bring his king to e7, uh, have an exchange on board. He's going to be fine. Uh, at the end of the day, uh, this is an end game. I think he could draw, potentially win. Uh, he, I think he decided to get a little bit too greedy uh, and play queen to e7. I don't think he calculated the end game as much as he could have. Um, and we see queen here to b3. Maybe this is the move he didn't see. Maybe, which we'll get to in a minute, this pawn here on f2 is what he did not think about. But th there's no real good move for black in this situation. He can't move his queen to block it. Uh, he can't really move his rook to block it because then just pawn pushing forward to uh, d8 getting a queen and check. Uh, that's going to be bad with the rook back here on d1 protecting that. So king over here to h8, kind of the only move. And then queen to d5 uh, is a very, very tricky, tricky spot. The pawn's threatening, pushing forward, uh, also attacking the pawn here on c5. Rook to d8 does stop that. But then after rook to d3, uh, then black is forced to resign in the game sometimes people always say well you know this doesn't look like a in game very easy for white to win how would this continue and the biggest thing to keep in mind uh, is that the rook could come here to uh, e3 uh, so for example if we were to see pawn to g5 uh, which makes a lot of sense uh, then you could easily just see rook to e3 threatening this queen there's no real good square for the queen to go to and as soon as he comes off his mark uh, then the, the rook can eventually come here to e8. Uh, but first you could see queen to c6. Uh, this kind of 
adds another attacker, not only to this d7 square, but more importantly, this e8 square. So now when the rook comes up here, uh, going to have an exchange and black is going to lose that. White's going to be up material. Also going to be threatening this pawn here on c5. So we see queen down here to h6 trying to gobble up material. Rook up here e8. Uh, all in all, this is going to be extremely bad for uh, for black. So that's what black saw on board. Uh, didn't see any way around that. So at the end of the day, decided to resign. So congratulations to Payul. He has two wins currently in the tournament. So that is definitely good. If he didn't have the last loss, uh, you know, he would be at the top of the leaderboard. But all in all, having a very good tournament so far, still in contention. Uh, for both top two and a good uh, payday at the end of this tournament. So thank you guys for watching uh, round three, uh, and we will be back tomorrow for round number four.